All right, everyone, I think we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, thank you for bearing, those of you who came on earlier, thank you for bearing with us with all of the different tech issues. Um, so I wanted to do some housekeeping first. Um, as you can see, you have a, if you are joining us from a computer um, on the web, you will have a toolbar. And on that toolbar, there are, um, there's audio connections and a list of the attendees and also a chat function. Um, we don't have any mer uh, material, so that, that area is empty. So if you would like to ask questions during this um, presentation, all you have to do is chat them straight to me, and we will open for questions at the end. And I will be taking all of, you know, kind of moderating the questions that come in and giving them to our presenters. Um, today, we are really excited to be talking about school climate transformation, the awesome surprising and challenging things that um, are happening in Berkeley Unified in their in their first um, in their first year of LCAP development and we are joined at, with our, our presenters today Judy Appel who's the current board president um, and um, a member obviously of the Berkeley Unified School District um, Josh Daniels, who was the BUSD board president at the time of the LCAP development and um, is still a board member, and also Debbie D'Angelo, who is the director of research evaluation and assessment for Berkeley Unified. Um, so I wanted to, if any of you have any questions or, you know, anything during the presentation, go ahead and send them directly to me, and then at the end, we will, um, at the end, we will open for questions and I'll start reading off the questions that we get. This webinar is being recorded and it will be available on, at our webinar archive on fixschooldiscipline.org. And I will also send out the actual presentation, but in a PDF form. And we have um, a couple of small changes to make, but in PDF form, um, I'll send it out to all of you with a link to the webinar archive if you would like to watch this again or share it with your colleagues. And without further ado, I will turn it over. Oh, well, I kind of want to tell you what we're going to be going over today. Um, so first we'll talk about how Berkeley Unified engaged the, school, the community um, around school climate. We'll talk about LCAP provisions and school climate reform, um, monitoring and implementation and what the progress looks like and then we'll open up for questions. And so I will now turn it over to our Berkeley team. Okay, thanks, Sarah. This is Josh. Thank you to um, Public Council for uh, putting on this webinar, and I appreciate all of you for taking the time on a Thursday morning to, to join us. I'm going to start with the first section, and then I'll turn it over to Judy and Debbie for uh, most of the, the rest. Um, just to start with sort of what we did, this is a brief overview of our community engagement. Um, we do not meet the threshold for English language learners to have an ELPAC, but we nonetheless chose to do so anyway. And then after consulting with a number of folks, we also created an education advisory committee or council. Um, and so we basically had three committees, um, the PAC, the ELPAC, and the EAC, um, we like to use acronyms, of course, and um, uh, you know those are the three main committees that helped us, to, you know, develop and then review uh, the LCAP. But being Berkeley, we have other committees that um, are involved in our district. We have a fairly large uh, parcel tax, and there's an oversight committee, the Planning Oversight Committee, called the P&O Committee. Uh, they were involved in discussing uh, the LCAP, as was our Superintendent's Budget Advisory Council. Um, so really, um, you, we had five separate district committees um, involved in one way or another in the development and review of the LCAP. Uh, going beyond district committees, we uh, included and reached out to a number of local organizations, some of which are listed there, uh, Latinos Unidos, BOSS, Building Opportunities for Self-Sufficiency, um, a better way that folks on foster youth. We also um, had parents of children of African descent, um, PCAD, uh, meet with them and a, and a number of other organizations. We also received uh, explicit proposals from 
uh, Berkeley High School and from PCAD about what they felt uh, should be in the all cap. Next slide, please. Um, at the beginning of this process, we wanted to try to engage the community as much as possible, sort of get them um, involved early, which would hope to carry their involvement through the process. We did two uh, public forums, one in October, one in December. We recognized that in the first year of the LCAP, sort of setting the community precedent um, in Berkeley about how we want to engage our community was important not only for the first year, but also for kind of setting the the threshold of precedent for years forward. So we tried really hard, even even in October, even before we knew what the template looked like, to start um, engaging with our communities. Uh, next slide. So this is one of our uh, parent meetings. Um, uh, the, the parents here are from the DLAC or ELPAC. Uh, next slide, please. So we also um, discussed uh, sort of beyond the sort of more, more formalistic outreach sort of in, internally. There, we have weekly principal meetings that the superintendent um, and the um, principals discussed uh, the LCAP at a number of meetings, um, school governance council, school site councils. And then we provided um, LCAP at berkeley.net, which was a dedicated email for all comments LCAP related. And um, I don't have the number offhand, but we definitely received dozens um, of comments, particularly as related to the draft LCAP that um, uh, we provided to the public in April and in May. The board met uh, six different times between October and June to discuss LCAP. And uh, amazingly, staff responded to every public comment, and not just the PAC, DLAC, or EAC comments, but literally every single comment via email. And, um, while that was fantastic, I don't know whether staffing-wise we'll be able to do that every year. But as a you know first time around the cycle, we figured you know we wanted to uh, be more transparent and more responsive, um, and see how you know how that went. Next slide, please. So it's hard to sort of break down what we learned into a simple slide, but uh, you know we did our best here. I think that that one of the main takeaways is this is a very long process and that the LCAP is, can be quite complex. Um, and so it not only does it take a lot of staff time, um, but just in general for community input and transparency and involvement, simplifying it is better. Um, you know, definitely it creates lots of work for staff in addition to all the other work that they're doing. Um, they were fantastic about it. I mean, Debbie and her team and the evaluations office were amazing. Um, the instructional side and the business side worked I'm um, just, just I think I, I had asked all of the um, employees to sort of add up how many hours they spent, and I think you know we were like thousands of hours. It was it was really impressive how much they sort of took this on and, and really ran with it. And I think that's one of the reasons why we feel so good about um, you know the product. And I do think though that that still you know as terms of a statewide sort of perspective needs to be considered about how much staff was required. The, you know, there is some uncertainty at the state level, and I think the county, at least that first year, is somewhat uncertain around sort of what is required in the LCAP. Um, we wanted to do some things that we felt would be more transparent rather than less, and the county sort of pushed back on that. And then, at least in Berkeley, um, you know, not not all metrics mean the same thing for us. We are lucky to have a maintenance parcel tax and uh, tax reported bonds, and so our facilities are not as much an issue as in other school districts. And yet, um, you know, issues around facilities are sort of weighted equally within the LCAP as everything else, when, when our challenges are much more related to climate, as, as you'll see. Um, we did a decent job with student input, but we definitely need more. And then uh, the last thing to note on this is that we are in the process. We just publicized a, a draft LCAP policy at a policy subcommittee meeting yesterday, and we're attempting to codify what we did and what we learned in that policy so that it's written down so that everyone can know uh, you know what it is we intend to do with our LCAP process. And now I will turn it over to Debbie um, to uh, sort of move the discussion more specifically to uh, climate and climate data. So during, this is Debbie, and during the uh, community um, forums, the 
PAC, the Parent Advisory Committee, the EAC, the Educational Advisory Committee, and our English Learner Advisory Committee, as well as other groups such as the principals and staff, we really um, received a number, a large number of requests around data specifically and more specifically around cli baseline climate data. And so these are three examples of what we saw last year. Um, the disproportionality in chronic absenteeism. African American and socioeconomically disadvantaged students were 33% more likely to miss school than their non-African American and non-socioeconomically disadvantaged peers. Um, there was a disproportionality in suspensions, um, a, a pretty extreme one, and, and you'll see a slide a little, little later on, that African American students made up over 50% of our suspensions. And um, at two of our elementary schools, suspensions were lower at other sites, and that gave us insight into what was happening there um, and a particular curriculum that we'll, we'll be talking about. Um, there was no quantifiable data last year on the alternatives to suspensions provided at the schools, which led into an action around our data system and around what we can put into our data system around alternatives to suspensions and consistently tracking um, referrals and um, incidences. Finally, the California Healthy Kids Survey and our District's Acceleration of Achievement of African American Students Work Group, of which I see a member is listening tonight, today, um, indicated a need for African American students to connect to an adult who can respect them and recognize their academic and social potential. The need for more cultural competency training, not only at the base level, but to the classroom level, and tools for students to feel welcome and connected to school. These led to uh, emerging themes, which um, really was, and I talked about this before, finding solutions to emulate, eliminate the disproportionality in suspensions, the alternatives to suspensions overall, and the need to um, have more into our data system. Mental health and trauma-informed support as a priority, um, early intervention system for struggling students, and around student engagement, classroom equity strategies to engage all learners. And now I'm going to hand it off to Judy. Oh, no, I think I'm continuing. Sorry. No, it is Judy. All right, I'll hold on one second. We have a little bit of a hiccup. Um, and let me go ahead and hi Judy ah, there you go hi can you hear me now yeah we can hear you yeah oh great hi everybody this is Judy Appel and um, I'm really happy to be here and it's really exciting to share with everybody um, kind of the process that we've gone through and how we have been able through our really inclusive um, process with the community that Josh talked about to um, really weave our climate goals, which I think are a priority of all of the board members and, I, and as well as staff, into I think all both our educational and our climate goals. So we wanted to start with um, the presenting the three goals that are a part of our LCAP, our Local Control Accountability Plan, and then we'll drill down a little bit deeper on, into goal three, which is our, specifically our climate goal. So after the process that both Josh and Debbie laid out and looking at the data, we, um, we, you know, we had something like 30 different versions that we kept coming that the staff would work on and, and workshop in, in a variety of different um, venues and then come back to the board with. And um, we had a couple of versions where we had a lot of different components. And what we decided to do was follow the lead of a couple of other, of other districts, because we were also reviewing other districts, and kind of distill these down into three different goals. So the three different goals in our LCAP are first, you can read them yourself, but first to provide high quality classroom instruction and curriculum that promote college and career readiness with academic interventions in place to eliminate barriers to student success. 
goal two, to end the racial predictability of academic achievement by ensuring that all systems are culturally and linguistically responsive to the needs of all of our students, and three, to ensure all school sites have safe, welcoming, and inclusive climates for all students and their families <clears throat> so that all students are in their classes ready to learn. So you can see more about this uh, on our website where we have all of our LCAP information. But one of the reasons why we put this slide up and the next couple of slides is to show how we really made an effort to have, to have our um, climate goals, particularly around, about um, kind of alternatives to dis alternative discipline methods and basic climate work at the core of our, um, of our, our academic goals as well. So let's, um, let's, if we can have the next slide. There we go. So just very briefly, you can see this. So this is our first goal. So under each goal, and we had the, the, the overarching goal, and then we provided here just a few of the relevant interventions that we included. And you can see that we also included under each goal the different sources of funding. And this year, Debbie will talk about this a little bit later, we're then making sure to track not just our progress uh, on each of the goals, but also, and action steps, but also how, um, if, and also the expenditures. So you can see here a few of these intervention supports for high-risk students, our AVID program for um, students who are first, um, who are, are college bound and whose parents haven't been, um, haven't ever, haven't gone to college, haven't gone to university. And then we have a bridge, bridge program, um, which we've had at the high school and we now have at the middle school, which is really exciting, but I'm not going to go into here. So we have more time for the climate goals. So if we can go to goal two. Again, um, here we have uh, the goal is to end the racial predictability of academic achievement. So these are really instructional, instructional action steps. Um, and a part of them uh, include uh, cultural competency training for our teachers, um, uh, consultants and specialists to make sure that we're increasing the number of teachers of color that we have in the district. Uh, our numbers are really low and we're um, trying to, and, and so we're, we're taking a specific action steps to try to increase both our hiring and retention. We see that also directly related to our climate work. And then also really increasing and making more robust our ELD teacher coaches at our school sites. So now I'm going to turn to, to goal number three and give you some snapshots of some of the interventions that, we're, um, that we've already begun. Obviously, we're just six months into our LCAP, so um, we really have some preliminary things to talk about, and we'd love to hear your feedback. So if we can go to the next slide. Judy, someone had a question about what BSEP means. I just wanted to, that was a question I thought was relevant right now. <laughs> oh, that's great. Yeah, I can't, I can't look at the chats while I'm um, presenting. So BSEP, thank you for calling us on our acronyms. So BSEP is our parcel tax. And it stands for Berkeley Schools Excellence Program. Thank you, Debbie. And it's so okay. it's, uh, it and it pays for about 25% of our teachers. It's a it's a um, it's a large it's a it pays for some enrichment. It pays for small class size and it, um, some professional development and a lot of our teachers through the small class size component. Okay, so let's go to um, goal three. If we can change the slide. Okay, so. With goal three, we have um, we decided that we wanted to have as a priority recognizing that in serving the students um, that are uh, the the students uh, the target students the identified students in this with the supplemental funds that it was important to focus on safe, welcoming, and inclusive climates uh, for our students. So. We have a huge problem, like many different districts, with disproportionality of suspensions and um, also uh, problems with truancy. And also, uh, this is all, and, and it's also tied into uh, to academic achievement. And so we we all recognized, and this also came from the community, that critical to addressing um, to addressing all of the, these issues was to really focus on climate. And so there's a couple of interventions that we have um, 
uh, that we've invested in and that we're continuing to invest in. So one of them is contracts with mental health and trauma support agencies. So this is a combination, this is an area where we are, um, where we're also collaborating with the city. Uh, we have mental health support from the city and we also are increasing the mental health of our um, uh, internally in our district. We, um, we have, uh, at the, one of the things that became evident with our new, we have some new leadership at the district was that it was important to actually do an audit of the mental health services in the district. So although it was not necessarily um, a part of the planning as we kind of drilled a little bit deeper into improving our mental health system, which was a resounding request from both the, um, the public and our educators, we found that there was inconsistency and that it was really important to do some focus groups and talk to both the counselors and the teachers and the administrators uh, and, and, and parents on site. So that's happening right now at the same time that we're um, building up our mental health uh, services and bringing trauma-informed practices into the district. A second component, I'll give you some uh, uh, snapshot, was in a moment was a, uh, to we had a pilot program of the Toolbox uh, Social Emotional Learning Program, um, which I'm not sure if you're familiar with, but it's a great program, and we'll hear a little bit more about it in a moment, uh, that was a part of our positive behavioral intervention and support at the K through 6 levels. And uh, we decided that it, this will set, would set the foundation for more positive climate starting at the earlier grades and moving up. And so it was kind of a preventative strategy that we're really excited about and is being evaluated. And then we, um, we had already had a pilot of a family engagement program and we extended that to our entire district. Uh, and then there were some other um, practices that aren't mentioned here, including increases in sort of justice and restorative practices, um, supporting our live and free programs. Uh, and some other programs that I would say we're still kind of at the beginning stages of incorporating throughout the district. So if we can go through to the next slide, I can give you a little taste of what these interventions are. So I talked a little bit about the mental health model in general, but I wanted to tell you specifically about um, one of our most successful schools, which is Longfellow Middle School. And at Longfellow Middle School, one of the major components of this, oh wait, can you go back? One of the major components of that um, program this slide is, is not that, interactive. Oh, is that there's a LCS? Is that there's an LCSW on site um, who brings in a very is very careful and and um, selective in the interns that she brings in and then cultivates. And one of the things that's interesting is that she is she runs what's called the Counseling and Positive School Culture Department. So the school has made, they have, they have two counselors and they've decided to have one academic counselor and one basically school culture counselor. And that counselor works with a slew of interns so that we're able to really focus on climate at that school. So the counselors do everything from, I mean, they'll have a group at that school run by one of these interns on anything that you can get two kids who agree on. If there's if there's a grief group or there's a girls group, my daughter is at that school and last year she was really annoyed with her parents, so they had like a kids who are annoyed with their parents group, which ended up being a girls group where a lot of really important issues came out. The kids weren't able to talk about those issues directly until they got into that safe space. Um, they also have themes every month. So, for example, last month was Ally theme, and that gives them an opportunity to talk about school culture issues directly. Um, every child is really seen in a way that uh, really builds the um, supports, and so it's very difficult to fall through the cracks. And that model has found itself to be really, really productive, particularly working in conjunction with a, a vice principal who believes in restorative practices and works with the counseling department to try to come up with any alternative to suspension when kids are kind of, you know, when kids kind of hit the radar and uh, start maybe acting up. So this model has been really successful at this one school and um, we're looking to see how we can replicate it more effectively in other schools in the district. Okay, let's go to Toolbox. 
don't film on this social emotional um, emotional program called Toolkit that we toolbox that we have brought now to every school, every elementary school, and is uh, at, through sixth grade in the middle schools, and one school is piloting it in seventh grade. My favorite tool is the garbage can tool because it helps me a lot sometimes when I'm frustrated. And all the tools help me because they make sometimes I'm a little bit mad and I need to use my breathing tool to calm down sometimes. My favorite tool is the computer tool because I use my toolbox a lot when I'm mad or frustrated or sad um, because they can help me calm down. Like sometimes I use my taking time away tool when I get frustrated at my house by my little brother. I go into my room and calm down there and then I use all the other tools in my toolbox like my breathing tool and my garbage can tool. Um, I'm going to show you how to use your breathing tool, and so this is how you do it. So let me put my stuff in there. Um, so you put your hand on your chest, put your hand on your stomach, and then you breathe in. Then you breathe out. Breathe in. And then you do that five times or three times. So they're so cute, and I, I, I almost, I'm from Berkeley, so I almost want to make any like hand on your chest and put your hand on your heart and take a big deep breath in and out. Um, we find that in a lot of now in a lot of meetings that we're in, people people use the breathing tool to try to bring things back to focus. Um, even the adults. So the way that the toolbox works is there's, I think, is it 10 tools? And there's um, there's these lanyards that have the tools on them, and they're very bright colored. And a lot of the adults, both the teachers and the administrators, walk around with the toolbox. And it sounds a little hokey, but the thing that is great about it is that the kids really use these tools as a way to help them be productive in community and address conflict when it comes up and self-regulate. And what we're finding is that it's starting to shift the culture. Now, the sixth grade, um, somebody asked in a, in a chat if the, um, if the middle school was a pilot that was um, covered by LCAP. And we were, we were paying for LCAP K through six. One of the schools decided to try the seventh grade. The teachers are just working with it. Um, there's, I don't think there's extra funding except for to go. I think they did go get trained. So I guess the funding for their training was covered by our LCAP. Um, and every, I mean, as you saw in, in the in the video, kids choose different tools to help them self-regulate, and teachers teach lessons to help um, to help bring that into the classroom. And although it's not um, tr it's not a traditional restorative justice circle, they do use class circles as a way to address to use the toolbox to address conflict when it comes up. So it's, it's we're still pretty new in the game, but um, some schools are in their second year. And, the, and report um, really positive outcomes, which uh, I think Debbie will talk about in a bit. So let's talk. Move to the to the family liaisons, so then we can hear some of the um, some of the uh, early evaluation data. So another intervention that we've been working on is specifically to address truancy, but also to to increase, as we all know, is important family school connections. Um, we have invested in a in a program where we now have a family liaison in every one of our elementary schools. Um, they're half time which it's actually how much their FTE really depends on the size of the school, but it's about a half time person per school. And they're doing a lot of different things there. They are working to help build the school community. They're working with families, but they're really targeted on third graders with low performance, low attendance, and who are socioeconomically disadvantaged. And they focus um, on contacts with the family. Um, and they're providing incentives 
to improve attendance and achievement. Um, we're also seeing uh, productive use of the school attendance review team and um, when necessary, when there's been chronic, uh, chronic absenteeism, school attendance review board, the, the SARPs. But the main thing that we're finding is that through calls home and contact with the family, we're really able to reduce the truancy numbers at the third grader. So it's the thing that we know that the, the, that the, the increased contact and per, like kind of personalization and knowing the kids is really helping um, is really helping families that have otherwise been kind of alienated from the school environment. And in, in, as a result, is really helping the kids show up for school and learn. Can we have the next slide? OK, now I think we're going back to Debbie. So hello again. Um, what we really focused on in our um, LCAP is not only all of these exciting programs and action steps, but really going through a cycle of continuous progress um, to assure that what we're implementing, that we're continuously evaluating that implementation. And as you can see here, last year we began with analyzing the data. I gave you some snapshots of that. Um, we, we authored and wrote the plan with 31 uh, revisions total. And then we are now in the implementation phase. Throughout this implementation phase, we are evaluating. And um, I'll talk a little bit about that on some future slides. But as we do this evaluation both throughout the year and at the end of the year, adjustments will be made and then the cycle continues. Next slide. Um, the, the questions that we're asking as we're doing our research and evaluation questions are it's to be effective and efficient. How can we tell if our programs are actually making a difference? Um, how can we figure out which students will struggle in advance so that we can target that social-emotional support, both as we explained with our family liaisons within our, our schools? How can we target our limited resources that we have to, for the students and target those for the families and students in most need? And finally, how can we talk about the achievement gap, which is now in educational circles called educational debt, without contributing to stereotyped threat? So really assuring that when we are having our conversations, that these conversations do not um, in itself imply institutionalized racism. Next slide. Our ongoing implementation and evaluation um, throughout the, the LCAP we did, we have baseline data at the end of the LCAP. There is a link to what our evaluation goals are. There's a needs assessment that we did that I explained a little earlier. But one of the key pieces, a key insight was the communication and transparency. And so on our website, on berkeleyschools.net at the top you can see an LCFF LCAP link but we do have an evaluation crosswalk in fact I will be loading the data from this slide and this and the board meeting last night onto this crosswalk and this is a short link that I made that you could go straight to that evaluation crosswalk the bit.ly link um, the evaluation is both qualitative and quantitative so we are continually using survey tools, focus groups, observations. Um, our superintendent goals are tied to the LCAP. We have partnerships with UC Berkeley around toolbox and mental health in the sense that we have interns working with the mental health evaluation. We actually have four different toolbox evaluations going on, three by different teachers getting their master's degree. And um, we also have a partnership with UC Berkeley on doing a full evaluation of Toolbox. And then we do have ongoing review at the trimester and semester using an LCAP evaluator that was funded 0 0.6, which is two days, 0.4, which is two days a week out of the LCAP. Um, and this ongoing review is at the trimester to semester, and you can see the variety of different things that we do at that time. 
Next slide. What we frame, and when I work, I have a staff, and this is thanks to the Berkeley Schools Excellence Program, the BSEP measure. Um, we have a staff in Berkeley Research Evaluation and Assessment. And whenever we work with the, with the staff, um, this is actually a slide from Dave Stevens, who works at the high school, really looking at students that are struggling face many, tail, may, many headwinds. And so they face headwinds such as their parent, parent education level, coming into school um, of students of poverty, English learners. And students that are successful have all these tailwinds that are support from home, a variety of different um, experiences that they are able to have outside of the classroom. And this helps to frame as we do our, our evaluation. Next slide. So what you see is what I was explaining. The tailwinds are those protective factors. And the headwinds are those extra challenges. And you can see these listed um, between on each side. So what's important is that when we are analyzing our data, it's important to analyze that data in all, using all of those different headwinds. And what Dave Stevens has created is called something the Academic Support Index. So we actually have an index to look at students with a variety of those different headwinds without using or terming those headwinds by name. Next slide. So I'm going to be sharing some spotlights with you. One of our action plans in the LCAP was, was about uh, making changes to our data system. Um, for those educators that are listening, we, we use PowerSchool as our student information system, and we use Illuminate for our assessment system. And so with our data system, PowerSchool, we, we wanted to interject the new law from edu Education Code, which provided for um, alternatives to suspension. And you can see a listing of the alternatives to suspension. Um, the ATOD stands for alcohol, alcohol, tobacco, and other drugs. Aspire, I do not know what that acronym spells out. Um, my board members might. <laughs> um, and I just lost the screen. There, I'm back. Um, some ahas that we had with these new alternative tools in our incident management system is that middle and high school are using this new language, which is extremely exciting because we just put this new language in um, more than the elementary schools. And now the curiosity for, for myself and my team is really looking at what, is, what do they define as restorative justice? What are they doing for conflict resolution and mediation? And now we can look at each school and look at, at, at the change in their disproportionality in suspensions and their suspensions and, and review their alternatives to see which ones are working. Um, a second way is a need um, to tag within the system if the alternative would have been a suspension. This is, a, this is something within PowerSchool that is not taggable yet. Um, I hope that our technology team is working with PowerSchool to see if this is possible. And then we still need further consistency in the entering of office referrals, with it, which I know is a common um, issue throughout different districts in California. Next slide. The next spotlight here is really looking at um, sex, sex secondary suspensions and the disproportionality. Um, as I explained, we do look at semester data as well as the end of the year. And what you see here is looking at semester one student counts and percentage of suspensions for 2013-14 and 2014-15. I do want to want to highlight that this slide will be changed. Um, there are some numbers that are less than 10, and I ask that anybody that is watching this slide or receive this in paper, that, um, that they do not share those numbers under 10. It is $2,000 because um, PK is just. Hi, sorry, I think someone, Judy, you might be unmuted. Sorry, okay. 
Okay, so um, anyways, what, what, there, what we see here is that our suspensions are going down for African American students without IEPs. These are students that are not special ed. We have a counseling enriched program, which is for students that have severe, severe emotional, social emotional um, needs, social emotional supports, and this is an intervention that we provide. Um, and then looking at students with IEPs that do not include counseling enriched, and that's the CEC acronym that you see there. Um, and so comparing African American students against those that are not African American, you can see that we still continue to have that disproportionality and that it is even more so with students that are in special ed. Next slide. Um, this is looking at the same question over time. So this looks at um, the percentage of suspensions um, comparing the same groups, African American against all others. And what you see in 12, 13, and 13, 14, that the percentage of African American suspensions went down. But when you compare that to the percentage of African Americans in our district, which is about 20%, this still shows um, disproportionality. This last semester, um, it, there was an inordinate amount of students that were suspended, so that, in, that increased a little, I mean, not an inordinate amount, about eight more um, African-American students that were suspended. And then, so that what this shows is an increase in the disproportionality this first semester, and this is a conversation that we're having at all levels within our district. And again, you're looking at below the semester one suspensions over time and broken out by those students, um, those same, same student groups. Next slide. And Debbie, our next can you just uh -huh. clarify whether that, Debbie? Can you, just, uh -huh. Judy, can you just clarify whether those are individual suspensions or individual students? These are individual Number suspensions. This is the count of students who are suspended. So the percent of students who are suspended. So this is counting students, not suspensions. Thank you. So these are student counts, not suspended suspension counts. Um, this next spotlight is the toolbox. Um, that we just shared and you saw in the video. Uh, the, the other exciting piece to the implementation of Toolbox is that we also last year implemented an, or designed an elementary common core report card. I facilitated this group and it was made up of teachers, teacher leaders, a few administrators, uh, support staff, and the behaviorists that was leading the toolbox training as well as teachers from the two model schools. And what resulted is in our elementary report card, rather than having um, for anybody that's seen a report card before or an elementary standards-based report card, there were social emotional or habits of work listings. These are specific to our social emotional domains in our toolbox. For example, the breathing tool that um, our student talked about. Um, and these are baseline results from the grade three cohort. So what this is is, is a, a group of students in grade three that we will be following throughout um, their time. And their average score out of four, so four is exceeding, three is meeting, two is approaching, and one is below and looking at their average score in uh, trimester one. Um, we will receive our trimester two results very soon to see if these have gone up. Typically, in elementary school, the grades are lower in the fall and tend to increase in the spring. What we see is that many students, despite the, the novelty of these new social-emotional domains, are reaching that three or four level. Um, there is a disproportionality in, the, in African American students versus um, the all, although African American students are counted in the all. And you can see that, that difference also with socioeconomically disadvantaged students. This next spotlight is looking at K-3 truancy. 
Uh, Tony Truman is looking at a bill around K3 truancy, and so I was asked to look at the last four years of students, including this year, the last four years of student um, truancy events. And these student truancy events show that um, the, first, the first piece shows all K through students over time. So you see different groups of students on the top slide, and you can see that in K3, our truancy rate, the average number of truancy events for K3 students with one or more events has gone down. So I didn't count any student that had zero events, only students that had one or more events. And then I really looked at our current third graders, again, that third grade cohort, it's also in our reading goal, um, looking at that cohort of students, if they had three or more truancy events, what type of change did they have over time? So the average change, what number, and then below that, the number of students that reduced their suspensions, the number of students that kept that rate the same, so three and three or five and five, and then those that increased. Um, looking at the students overall, what I did see is those students with the larger number of um, suspensions were those that the intervention, it had to get to the DA level until that intervention really took hold. But those with the lower um, three or more, three to 10, where that change or that intervention really truly made a difference. There was a question on the past slide on suspensions. We also did look at the number of the suspension rate, and that is also disproportionate in semester one, but I did want to look at counts because we had an unusual number of a few students with a, a total number of the suspensions. And so the, the data was not valid, it was, the data would show um, an, an unclear picture because the, there were very few students with a lot of suspensions. So to answer that question about suspensions. Next slide. So this Josh. Is Josh. This is Josh again. I'm going to wrap us up. Um, so these are just some things we've been thinking about as it comes to sort of ongoing monitoring and accountability. I'll just read the question. So, you know, how frequently does the board need updates regarding implementation? Judy, as board president this year, has done a good job. Um, she's, we've already had um, two updates, I believe. Um, yes. About what's been going on for the 14, 15 year. Um, you know, we do have other things we need to focus on, too. So the sort of balancing that is, is something that we'll continue to think about and work on. How does oversight and monitoring fit in with developing annual updates? So, you know, part of the need to monitor and to oversee the implementation is to help us figure out what to modify as we do the annual updates from here on out. And it relates to the next question about timing of outcome data. So, you know, some of the specific actions and services that we have opted to do, we may not get complete data, and in some instances very little data, um, until the very end of the school year, if not afterwards. And so how do we sort of um, make decisions with imperfect data uh, is obviously a challenge. Do we wait? Do we try to look, as Debbie was showing, on semester, you know, comparing semester one versus semester two? You know, what, on a function level, how do we use the reality of, you know, sort of data collection and, and um, information collection to help us make informed decisions when we don't always, in fact, most of the time, we don't have all the information that we need. Can I interject one piece on that too as well, Josh? Please. Um, the other piece is that there are eight priority areas and about 25 now expected um, outcomes for the state. And most of those are outcomes that come from the state, such as a smarter balance assessment, English learner data. And we have not received um, that data from the state yet, even for last year. Um, and then the, the, the last sort of question that we um, will continue to sort of discuss and struggle with is, you know, the PAC, under law, PAC and, and ELPAC, they're tasked with supporting the development, well, technically they're, they're tasked just with the review and comment, but functionally they're going to help with the development as well, 
Um, they're not really tasked to sort of oversee the implementation, but it is important for them to know about it um, so that they can advise the district and the board on, you know, updating and improving the annual update. And so how, you know, how we balance that role so that everyone is clear and, um, you know, everyone is focused on their responsibilities as part of the process is going to be sort of a challenge um, as we all sort of come to understand what LCAP is and means. Um, and so, as I mentioned earlier on, we had published or published this draft LCAP policy, and um, some of these questions we are attempting to answer through that policy, and other of these questions, it will simply take time to sort of work out in practice. All right, so that brings us to the end of the presentation, but um, now we're at the beginning of um, the question time, and I have a lot of really great questions um, for um, our presenters. Um, so actually, one of them was a, just a quick question about PAC, DLAC, and EAC, um, if you could um, say what those acronyms stand for. Um, just for some of our, our our viewers who joined a little bit later. Sure, this is Josh. So the PAC is the Parent Advisory Committee, the committee required by law for all districts to sort of create and help in the LCAP development process. The ELPAC, the English Learner Parent Advisory Committee, is the equivalent of the Parent Advisory Committee, but focused on um, parents of English learners. Um, in Berkeley, uh, what we've done is we've made the ELPAC the same as our District English Learner Advisory Committee, or DLAC. So we have tended to use ELPAC or ELPAC interchangeably with the you know acronym DLAC. And then the EAC is a, something we created in Berkeley called the Education Educators Advisory Committee, which is basically sort of the equivalent of the PAC and the ELPAC, but for uh, principals, teachers, instructional aides, and other employees of the district that work, um, you know, that are educators with respect to our students. All right, great. Um, the next sec uh, the next question was about um, within the three goals. Um, so I think this goes back to a question about um, the the LCAP goals, and within the three goals, did implicit bias become part of the conversation? Yes. I, I, implicit bias was a part. I, I, I mean, others can join in. And I noticed, actually, we have two other members of our school board who are listening in. And implicit bias was, I think, a top-line conversation that was woven into, I think, all of our strategies. Okay, and I yeah I would add to that um, as we as I shared we um, the prior year we actually had a plan that was voted on by the board to um, f focus um, funds on which are was our acceleration of the achievement of African American students we also have been working um, and examining cultural competency for the last four years with teachers going through trainings and just really the need of just examining data within as I shared um, looking at those struggling groups and also really examining that without um, contributing to stereotype threat. Um, and so woven within our goals one and as especially goal two is that um, is how we can address these pieces. Well, and I want to say two other things about that. This is Judy. One of them is so in addition to the cultural competency trainings, which are, are good and they're not an ongoing, you know, that's not the part that's an ongoing, uh, that's the ongoing work, and we've heard that feedback a lot. They're mm -hmm. really important, and a lot of our, our teachers have, have taken the, the trainings from the, the consultant who we have hired to do them. Um, but some of the things that support, and we have a lot of work to do, I do. Um, and, I, and we're, I, I think that that's one of the hardest pieces because changing the way that teachers are engaging in the classroom is, um, it, as a as a as a culture in this in the school district, is always you know it's a big task. 
there are a few things, a few um, strategies that we're using that, I'm, that are encouraging. One of them is that we have an equity rubric that was developed about maybe five years ago. Is that right, Deb? Well, yes, years ago. yes, and, and I now, believe it, yeah, maybe six. Maybe six. Yes. Um, and it, it, for a while, it, we were a little bit unsure exactly how to implement that at the district level. We have a new, um, we have new leadership in the district this year, and we have now equity uh, leaders in every school site that are um, bringing the equity rubric to, uh, to, um, and, and to kind of hold, to, to bring those skills to the school site and then hold, um, the school sites and the educators accountable using pieces of the equity rubric. And finally, we have PLCs, uh, professional learning communities, that the um, ad administrators are engaged in, and this is actually a part of the LCAP as well, that are focusing on different, different questions that are linked to the question uh, to stereotype threat or um, implicit bias and uh, implementing strategies in their school sites that would address um, address address that. So I, I do think we're taking a lot of steps and I think time will just tell how effective that will be. Um, again, it's the, it, you know, in really shifting particularly, you know, more resistant um, educators or folks for whom it's more challenging. And continually having this conversation, we had a very exciting um, step in um, January where all of our uh, elementary teachers were were actually trained by a partnership between our administrators, our principals, or our district administrators, and an equity teacher leader, and they focused on four key strategies. All right, great. Um, then there was another question about, um, so one of them, and I think it, it happened a little while ago, so I'm, I'm trying to remember um, when it was, but it was a question about whether the middle school was a pilot and was that an internal school initiative? And was that was the initiative funded with LCAP money? And so I'm actually going to take us out of um, this view to see if we can find. I, I remember it was um, somewhere around. It was before the family liaison. So I think that we was the toolbox. Yeah, it was a toolbox, and I, I tried to answer that question and say that the. K through six was um, was was across the board, and that school took the initiative to to include um, the seventh grade as well in the toolbox. And I think that I mentioned this. I the the teachers, the seventh grade teachers, did go to the training. So to that ex to, to the extent that they were trained, um, and I, I would imagine the materials were also um, provided by the districts using the LCAP funds. Uh, mm -hmm. But it was a, a site, it was a site, I believe, Debbie, isn't that correct? It was a site-initiated pilot. Yes, it was a site-initiated pilot, and um, the model of using um, volunteers and interns in this school, the picture that you are looking at right now, um, that is um, Rosina, who's on in this picture, is part of the mental health evaluation that we are um, looking at, and so we have a partnership with the city. Um, and uh, we have a partnership with the county, and they are really investigating what are the practices within the mental health model that is occurring. So we receive money from the city for our elementary schools, as well as looking at that funding, looking at the different mental health services that are provided, and, and looking at, at, at a continual model. So that's to answer that question a little bit further. Okay, great. And then someone asked a question about the staffing formula at Longfellow. How many students to mental health professional um, ratio? What was the ratio there? So um, there are approximately, four, and I, I can pull it up on my other computer, but there's about four, 432 students, and each student is assigned a counselor as far as the the depth to which they utilize that counselor, that is decided, and it's, it's more of a privacy right piece, and so I do not have that specific data, but I, I can find that out, and then um, I will be posting uh, materials from the report card on, um, on the uh, public council site, and I will also uh, uh, get that answer. Um, like but I think uh, of that photo, I think there's three people in that photo who are not counselors and the rest. I think there's, right. something, there's something like eight counselors to 400 students. 
Okay, great. Um, and then the but other question. So there's one of those that's the LCSW. The rest are interns, but they're interns working directly with students. Okay. Um, uh, there's another question about how, if you have had teams, school teams, trained in PBIS. Yes. Yes, I can answer that question. Or okay. Judy, do you want to answer? No, go ahead. Go ahead, Debbie. So two years ago, or actually three or four years ago, we began the PBIS training, and we had two trainings per year, the same behaviorist that is now assigned to Toolbox. Um, and those, um, each of the schools brought a team that included uh, parents, family members, uh, the key teachers at the school, as well as if they had a counselor or depending on the school makeup, um, that came to uh, planning meetings and training meetings for PBIS. And then eventually after the second year, we, they really put together binders. So each school uh, put together a PBIS binder, a PBIS action plan, and that is actually where in the elementary schools um, uh, the system around incident management came with a piece around something called uh-ohs and positive, this positive, um, having positives rather than negatives for the students to really increase um, or decrease the behaviors that were um, being referred to the office and to increase the school climate at the school. And there are a variety of different models throughout um, the district that they are looking at. And PBIS is continuing and is alive and well. And I, I really see Toolbox as an umbrella under the PBIS. Um, and our partner at the Alameda County really sees mental health as the big picture. And both of those fall under the umbrella of mental health. Both, uh, PBIS I, and I would say and that yeah, so every school has a PBIS team, and they mm -hmm. are a part of, they, they also participate in the, the, the snapshot meetings that go on that, where we look at each student and address, kind of address the needs of each student. And then there's other, there's Toolbox, and then we also have um, another program called Welcoming Schools that we've been doing for about six years that also helps bring in kind of allied behavior and anti-bullying. Um, resources. So it's the, 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 because there's an, an active and productive team at each school, although there's not necessarily consistency across um, each site, um, most sites have really vibrant teams that are working together um, and working also with the equity team leader. And the family liaison. Okay, awesome. Um, thank you. Um, so another question that came in um, is about hearing more about Lifelines Academy, Alive and Free, and then also someone who wanted to know more about professional development for social-emotional learning for school staff. So um, the Lifelines Academy is, uh, actually I'll start with Alive and Free. Alive and Free is a program that is provided in partnership with our 2020 vision, which is, which I'll start with that, which is a partnership between the University of California, Berkeley, um, the city, and our district, as well as community partners. And um, Dr. Joseph Marshall um, is pretty well known for his work around um, the prison to pipe, or the pipeline to prison services and really the Alive and Free program is the, the far-reaching alternative to, an, um, to suspension for students that have had more severe um, disciplinary actions. And um, that program is, has been at our Berkeley Technology Academy for a number of years, um, now funded through the LCAP this year for, for their, they're called BTA. And then um, the Lifelines program also includes um, students from uh, Berkeley High School. I've had the opportunity to observe the program um, in, in action as I was walking into a meeting a number of times that was uh, succeeding the program. And students are engaged in different conversations around, um, around different alternatives and they really actually have a, um, they actually say that they want to be alive and free rather than um, their other choices that they've made in their past. And that's funded again through the LCAP. 
Okay, great. And and then are there also, um, could you kind of talk about professional development um, for so, social emotional development for school staff? Have you, um, and I think just to help, you know, with the other questions that have also come in, um, what are all of the different, uh, so what are the different professional development, I guess, opportunities um, and, um, and, and events that you have for your school staff? So, again, in, um, in January, all teachers in elementary school were invited to a professional development day. It, it's part of our calendar, so we schedule different pro professional development days, both during the day and after school. In January, and thanks to our new leadership, the beginning of the day was about full inclusion of special ed within the classroom, and that included um, that included that discussion around disproportionality and um, and around the alternatives to suspension, a variety of different pieces, and how to fully include our special ed students in the classroom. And through the data, you can see um, some of the pieces of that. Um, in the afternoon, as I shared, really the importance of having that, uh, when I talked about the findings from our acceleration of achievement of African American students, and the students themselves, really wanting that connection with an adult at the school and to feel that they're, they're valued as an, as an academic um, student and valued as a social emotional, uh, a healthy social emotional student. And that after, in the afternoon there were strategies so that teachers could immediately implement these strategies in the classroom, including how to um, look at multiple perspectives, really that high help high perfection, really how to assist all students in the classroom, um, the no opt-out where all students are participating in discussions. And so in that case, the, the need sometimes um, in observations that I made when I was a principal, a young teacher may not realize who they're calling on or that they're always choosing the student that's raising their hand, which tends to lead to um, some wiggle monsters at the back of the classroom. And so that having that no opt-out so that all students are engaged in their instruction. And then it's in addition, we invited our um, our classified staff, so staff that is working with the students in the classroom and with the students out on the playground. Um, and that's one example. We also do provide professional development, as I explained, in the professional, um, in the PBIS. Our, um, the toolbox training um, was for every teacher in K through sixth grade. So they received that training at the beginning of this school year. And for those that started new and wasn't able to receive the training, we've had makeup trainings so that every teacher is engaged in this toolbox training. And it's integrated into the report card in elementary school through our social emotional domains. And then in middle school, we actually have a second grade, which is called Habits of Work. And for sixth grade, that includes the toolbox. Okay. So those are just some examples. OK, great. Thank you. Um, I think there's also some questions about um, whether you are willing to share evaluation tools um, for implementation in other districts. I think there are a couple of other district folks here who would love those tools to help them. Um, those tools? Those tools are on our website. I will, um, I, I've um, given the, the link, I will send the other links to our website. It's berkeleyschools.net. On the top is a, a link that says LCFF LCAP. If you link, if you click on that, that actually gives the LCAP from last year. And um, to last night at our board meeting, and this would be another click in our website, if you go to our board meetings, we actually list the agenda item by name. So if you go to our board meetings, it actually lists out the minutes. And I'll try and send these links when I'm sending the updated PowerPoint. Um, I'll great. send all these links. Um, but that, that actually, we um, did a presentation last night on our evaluation tools. And there's also a link to our board packet, which includes some of those evaluation tools. And Debbie, I don't know, forgive me if this is Judy, if you already said this, but we also were very um, we're very lucky to have an LCAP evaluator on the team. Yes. 
which is one of the things we decided to invest in. And we, lo we love to share. So if anybody has any questions and wants to contact Debbie directly, she can put you in contact with that person who might be able to walk your staff through. Um, at least. Yes, that's and, a, and I'm sure we'd love to learn from you because I'm sure there's things we want to hear what others are doing as well. Yeah, that's great. That's definitely what all of these, um, the webinars and the toolkit are all about, just making sure that we're kind of networking all of the best practices. Um, so there's another question about what it means to be counseling, counseling enriched. Um, that came up, I think, around um, um, when when Debbie was giving out some of the data, and so I'm hoping we can explain what counseling enriched means. So uh, again, these are students that are identified. They have an individualized education program, which means that they are are in special ed, and their um, they they as far as their um, primary disability. Um, is usually identified as emotionally disturbed or within their IEP, the Individualized Education Program, um, there is a counseling component. So in the counseling enriched classroom, the ratio is very, very low. It's less than 10. Um, that counseling enriched classroom includes not only a teacher, but a counselor and a, um, and a classified um, paraprofessional that is trained in, in serving uh, students that are counseling enriched. So it is, it is our alternative term to special day class in some senses, okay. but with more supports. Okay. And we have, we have classes in one of the elementary schools, two of the middle schools, and the high school. Correct. Yeah. Um, and then there's a question about, and I don't know, maybe there, you guys don't necessarily have this answer, but um, which of the alternatives to suspension have you found to be most effective? And I guess also then, you know, a follow-up to questions about that came in is about, or is it the, you know, is it most effective to put all of the different alternatives to suspension together? And so... So we, um, as I shared, this has just been implemented. So I was surprised to actually, I mean, I was actually pleasantly surprised to see that the schools were already using these alternatives to suspension. So the tags, were, if anybody understands the back end of a data system, it takes time to program those alternatives and to assure that everything is flowing smoothly. So those were put in. Um, the the staffs, the staffs were trained, or those that are that are entering the data were trained that these exist, and um, these alternatives exist. And then, as I shared, we are part of the evaluation process right now is looking at which schools are using the alternatives more often, and then really getting um, definition of how they're using them, observing what they're doing. Um, we do have funding, as um, Judy shared for a SEEDS um, program, which is a restorative justice program. And I've requested to watch professional development, and that's another example of professional development. Um, I've asked, asked to attend some professional development or have my evaluator attend some professional development around restorative justice to observe that program, as well as all others that are happening throughout the district. If they're marking that, it's giving us a chance to say, okay, this is something they're using. But no, they do not use them as a bulk. I mean, the alternatives to suspension are not used as a bulk piece. The other alternatives, um, it's slide um, 27, I believe. Okay. Um, or it's, sorry, that's the wrong PowerPoint. Um, my computer went down. But it's a slide about the implementation evaluation update and alternatives to suspension. Um, okay. Those, the behavior intervention plan, which is, is something that happens through our behaviorists. Um, community service is an alternative um, for the high school where they're, they're providing um, maybe tutoring, a variety of different things, conflict resolution, mediation. I'm hoping that those that are listening have heard those terms before. Um, and the Lifelines Academy and Alive and Free, I was able to explain, and that's um, solely at our high school at this point. Um, so those are just some examples. Parent shadowing is when a parent comes and shadows their student in the classroom. Okay. 
And I, I just want to add to that that we, um, so we're working on this and we have kind of these individual programs and alter alternatives and we're, um, it's an area where we need to continue to work to have an overall kind of comprehensive uh, program, well. consistency and program uh, uh, for and structure for alternatives. Alternative forms of discipline, or you know, for alternatives to discipline, or, or alternative forms of discipline to suspension, because I think we're still we're still working on that. Okay, um, and then there are some questions about you know, monitor, you know, if you're implementing restorative justice and kind of what does your, um, um, mo I guess, implementation and monitoring kind of look like. So I, I think that I already answered that question yeah. is that we are, we, it, it's now I have approached each of the schools mm -hmm. and asked them to come and observe that implementation monitoring. In our LCAP, it explains that there is a SEEDS program and I have uh, spoken to different teachers and different folks, um, both at the district and the, and the site level, and now the next step is to go and observe those programs, as well as other restorative justice or restorative practices that they're using at the school. Um, and so at this point, I, I want to wait to be able to truly observe before I can comment on it. Right, right, right. Um, and I'm trying to go and just, you know, bear with me for one second. I'm just trying to go to the list of suspension alternatives slide again for people who um, keep asking questions about that. And so I think it's slide, you said 23, right? No, um, let me, I, I have it on another, I have it on another computer. It is slide 23. Okay. Oh, yes. Okay, great. Um, let me just pull it up. Okay, great. So now it's up. I know a lot of different people have been asking about that. Um, and so then there's another question about how are you, um, uh, let's see, sorry, give me a minute. There were a lot of questions that just came in. Um, okay, there's a question about SARDs and SART processes and how they're different. Um, because many community organizations have had some um, bad and challenging experiences with SARBs, um, as sometimes they can be punitive and focus on criminal sanctions and pushing students and families out of schools. And so there's kind of a question, um, it, it, you know, SARBs can often be, you know, kind of this just focus on, you know, quote, end quote, scary students. And so how do you, how is your process different? Can I, I'm going to ask you to do something kind of unconventional. Is it possible to unmute Beatrice Leva Cutler, who is the board oh, member cool. on our, of, from our, our board, who is, has been going to the SARPs for years, and she can talk really about our, our unique approach and supportive yeah. approach in Berkeley? I, Are you willing, can you I do, can that, do that, Beatrice? Yeah, hold on one second. Beatrice, are you willing <laughs> to do that? You're unmuted now. Uh, Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Can you hear me? Okay, great. Uh, Not to put you on the spot or anything. <laughs> no kidding. <laughs> so uh, pretty much um, see, it's like five years now, I think, that I've been participating as a board member on the school attendance review team. And that essentially is our uh, director of student services and our uh, staff from admissions and our parent liaison. Uh, for community engagement, parent engagement. And then our counselor, if it's a counselor from the high school, uh, we, or mental health or community-based organizations that are surrounding us that support our students. And we essentially, these are students who have, at the school level, have not, have had a start level, a, a, a student uh, review team at the school site look at their attendance and uh, things have not worked well on the school site and they haven't been able to support or for whatever reasons uh, the attendance and treats continues and so then they're referred to the SARC board. And that's where we help and work with the family to really find out what are the alternatives, what are programs that can better support our students. And I think we found a lot of success on, our, on that level. 
because whether it's getting them directly involved with a, a mentor or a program, um, finding some support systems for the parent also to how to support their student, um, it's really become a, a brainstorm essentially for how do we support you students and what do you need from us. And from the parent, what do you also need from us in terms of how we can help you to help your student? So I find it has been not punitive, but actually a, per, a very personalized way of supporting our students who have had issues around attendance. Uh, and it, sometimes it's all it's how can we get some tutoring after school support for the, for the students. All right, great. Thank you so much for um, answering that question on the spot. Um, and now I'm going to mute you again. Um, <laughs> <laughs> just just so she knew that I wasn't, you know, she wasn't going to be able to talk back to me again. Um, so the another question that has come in is a, question, a lot of questions actually about the equity rubrics. Um, and so do you, you know, what does an equity rubric look like? People are asking to see one as an example because they're very um, interested and I don't know if you have one on your website or if you could, you know, we do. talk to that. So, you do. Okay, um, great. So, I, and again, I will be sending, I apologize about the phone call. Um, I will be, I'm going to pick it up and hang it up. Um, <laughs> I will be, sorry, whoever that was. Um, I will be sending the, the links on our LCAP itself. Um, let me see if I can mute that. Um, on our LCAP itself. It's not too distracting, too, if you want to just okay, let okay. it go to voicemail. It's totally okay. okay. So on our LCAP itself, the, there is an appendix, and included in that appendix is our equity rubric. Um, I, will, I am sending links to the LCAP page on our website. Right. Um, directly to the LCAP um, 30A is the version that we have up uploaded to our website and in the appendix is the um, equity rubric and it is very very detailed so okay. we go into district implementation we go into school governance we talk about instruction um, and and how we measure this rubric is really looking having the schools or the principals or the teams underline the looking at the sentences that are within each of the different rubric areas so approaching or beginning um, what what are they where are they at now and then where are they at towards the end of the year and we've done this again for years with the principals and what our goal is to be begin really using that with we have PLCs professional learning communities at the principal and support staff level. We also have an amazing professional developer that I did not talk about specifically before when we talked about professional development. We have a professional development coordinator that also does VITSA um, that helps with all of this. Um, but that, sh um, that equity rubric, then we are looking at rolling out with the teachers in the classroom as we have done those equity strategies in January. So I will link it so that folks can see um, the actual rubric. Right, and yeah, I just wanted to say, to oh, you and I'm looking on the website, and it is kind of hard to find the. the yeah, and I will send yeah. the links because the link to the LCAP is BerkeleySchools.net/local-control. Okay. But um, I will send it. I'm 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 preparing this as we're talking. Okay, great. And so, and I also for people who are asking. Will the PowerPoint be available? Will you record it? Um, you know, will you send this out to us? Don't worry. Um, when the uh, webinar is posted onto the website, so the recording that we are having right now, when it is posted onto our website, I then send out an email to all of the registrants, so not just people who attended, but people who registered for the webinar, and to our listserv. And I just kind of send that out so that you get the PowerPoint, um, in PDF form, of course, the work, a link to the recording and then any other links that the um, presenters want to follow up with. So we'll make sure to get Debbie's links to the rubric, to the LCAP, all of those different things. Um, and I will be providing actually in um, on a PDF both the report card, uh, the communication that we have with teachers that, that outlines the toolbox 
and as well as the equity rubric. I'll, I'll send it out separately. Right, and I know that we're coming to the end. We have just one minute left, but I have um, one kind of LCAP follow-up question left, and then you know we'll thank our presenters and let them get back to their very busy um, days. Um, but the, the question, these are two LCAP process questions. So one is relating to what is the plan for engaging youth voices in the LCAP development this year? And then the other question is about how are you tracking um, the expenditures that you're making that were promised in the um, in the LCAP last year. So, however, you know your budget expenditure um, commitments. How are you tracking those? And then, how do you plan to um, engage youth voice? So this is Josh. I'll, I can take both of those. So, our um, deputy superintendent, chief business officer, created local accounting expenditure codes for each specific action. So, or service uh, listed in the LCAP, so we could track um, uh, budgeted and actual expenditures by specific action and service. And then, in terms of reaching out to students, um, we have identified the student leadership um, at our uh, comprehensive high school and student leadership at our alternative high school, as well as the student body presidents at our three middle schools as being the students that we would. Um, directly engage with, whose comments we would have to respond to in writing, who would be basically treated um, at the level equivalent to the PAC in terms of their involvement. And we are hoping that um, while we may in engage other students beyond that, that that um, will improve our average to students compared with last year. Okay, great. All right, well, then we have now come to the end. We're, I think, finishing almost right exactly on time. Thank you, thank you so much to Josh, Debbie, and Judy for helping us understand what the LCAP development process looked like. Gave us a lot of really great food, you know, good food for thought for when we're developing the LCAP again this year. Um, and with all of that, if your questions were answered, weren't answered, please do um, go ahead and shoot me an email to um, S-O-M-O-J-O-L-A at publiccouncil.org um, and maybe we can, you know, send those questions over to our presenters and they can follow up with you. Um, and I want to thank everyone um, to uh, thank everyone and, and encourage everyone to go to fixschooldiscipline.org as well. We will have um, a model school climate LCAP with the kind of the uh, new template that is out. We'll have that up on our website. And, and without further ado, everyone have a really great day. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, everyone.